Let's talk about the spectrum of a sampled signal. When we do that, we'll have a better understanding of something called the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem. Let's start with a block diagram showing all of the components together. Together, these pieces form the front end of our digital system. This filter is called the anti-aliasing filter. Its purpose is to band limit our modulating signal. So we'll call that F sub M max. As the name implies, this is very important to prevent aliasing. And we'll explore what that means in a moment. This analog to digital converter has two inputs. The first is the intelligence, which we called F sub M, with the stipulation that it's band limited. The other input is the sampling frequency, so F sub S. The output of the ADC is digital. In this particular example, every time or every rising edge of the sampling frequency, 16 bits will be developed and passed on to the rest of the system. Those bits can be stored, they can be processed, they can be transmitted. On the other side of this system, we'll find a digital to analog converter, which takes in, in this case, 16 bits and outputs an audio signal, which is low pass filtered, amplified, and sent to a loudspeaker. Know that the digital to analog converter also has a clock input, which is called sampling frequency just like the ADC. Before I forget, I should mention that there's an integrity aspect to this. With error correction codes like Reed Solomon that allow the system to recover bit errors. For example, if there's a scratch on your CD, the system will still work. So in that case, the sound came in to the microphone went through the anti-aliasing filter, was digitized, then was stored with that integrity we just talked about. And when the time comes, it's sent to the DAC with those error correction codes taking care of From the ADC's perspective, this is a mapping operation. On the vertical axis is the binary numbers. If we chose 8 bits, this lower one would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, going all the way to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. The horizontal axis is, of course, time. Each division would be the time sample. Remember that there is a relationship between the sampling frequency and the period at which we sample. On the vertical axis, the smallest measurement we can make is known as the quantizing error, which can be calculated as the full-scale voltage of the analog-to-digital converter divided by 2 raised to the bit depth. So in this particular case, it would be 2 to the 8th. Anyway, this grid is used to talk about the analog signal that gets sampled. This is an analog signal that is sampled. Sampled implies that at a specific time, a voltage to numeric conversion will take place. This is the first sample taken at time zero. 
at the next time period. The signal is here. Moving over, we're now here and here. By the way, you'll notice that I'm rounding to the floor, which means I'm taking the bar that's immediately below the sample for that particular time period. When all is said and done, this analog signal has effectively become this stair-steppy signal. Think of this highly technical term, stair-steppy, as a giant spreadsheet. You could think of it this way. We have a series of cells. Each cell contains a number describing what the voltage was at that particular sampling period. In fact, if you wanted to, you could literally load the audio or the music into a spreadsheet. You could make a plot of that data. Right? If you plotted all these values, you would obtain the original signal. Naturally, when you plot this chart, you'll want to turn on the smooth edge function. To get rid of the stair-stepping nature contained in the data table. Tell you what, there's a bunch of detail that we need to fill in right now with regards to this sampling before we can get to the Nyquist-Shannon criterion. I'm going to ask you to pause this video and go take a look at Technology Connections where Alec has put together a beautiful video that will fill in that data in a way that, frankly, I couldn't. That video is called Nyquist Shannon, the Backbone of Digital Sound, and I have a link in the comments below. Please go watch it and then come back and we'll explore the spectrum of the sampled signal. Excellent. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and record the takeaways from that video. Sampling is done at a specific rate called the sampling frequency. The signal must be band limited before reaching the ADC. That's done with our anti-aliasing low-pass filter. The settings for that filter are determined by Nyquist-Shannon, where the sampling frequency must be greater than 2 by the maximum modulating signal. You'll notice the term F sub M. You've seen this before, and it allows us to have some consistency. It's the same term, the same position, as when we talked about AM modulation and when we talked about FM modulation. We've also called this baseband, and we've called it intelligence. Make a point to emphasize this aspect of before. Our signal must be band limited before it reaches the ADC. If it's not, you end up with something called aliasing, which I'll explain in a minute by showing the spectrum of the sampled signal. Before we present the spectrum, let's work a quick example to make sure we understand this equation. Suppose you are talking on the telephone. Your voice will be sent to the anti-aliasing filter, which is a low-pass filter, before reaching the analog-to-digital converter. We'll let this analog-to-digital converter have an 8-bit depth, and let the sampling frequency equal 8 
kilohertz. Based on this information, we need to determine the appropriate setting for this low-pass filter, which is a relatively easy question because we just use the equation. In this case, the sampling frequency is 8,000, which means the modulating frequency, F sub M max, must be less than 4K. This number gives you something to think about. What does music sound like when it's played over the phone? The answer is not so good. And the reason it's not so good is because it's band limited. All of the high frequencies, right? Anything over about 4 kilohertz has been removed. Moving on, let's talk about the spectrum of a sampled signal. This discussion starts with our voice frequencies. In the past, we've drawn these as a wedge that went from about 300 to 3000 hertz. In some circumstances, it helped to think about negative frequencies as well. And they were certainly displayed on the GNU radio. Forgive me as I throw this out. Instead, we're going to represent voice frequencies as a triangle shaped like this. We're still in the frequency domain. So we go from 0 to 3000 for voice. And if you like, you can go into those negative frequencies so this would be negative 3,000. At any rate, this is our baseband voice signal, which has been band limited to 3,000 hertz. It's this band limited signal that's sent to the ADC and turned into a table of numbers. This is where things get a little strange. In a moment, we are going to show the spectrum of the sampled signal. What we're actually describing is the spectrum of the data contained within the table. So we're actually talking about the samples themselves and how they would manifest if we actually did convert them back into an analog signal. We can visualize this spectrum by running the values through a DAC, taking the digital data and converting it into the analog. But it's not exactly analog at this point. It's stair-steppy. Because we're looking at the DAC directly before that signal is passed through a low-pass filter. But none of this matters for our conversation right now because the data table itself has an implicit spectrum. That spectrum was determined by the analog signal that went into the ADC, the operation of that low-pass filter, and how it interacted with the sampling frequency. Now hold on to your socks. Remember the conversations we've had about spectrum. We talked about the Fourier series dealing with square waves. We talked about AM modulation. And we talked about FM modulation. And every single one of those had a particular spectrum associated with it. It's no different for sampling. And here's what that spectrum looks like. It starts at zero. And then there is a wedge of frequencies. We'll assume the voice frequencies like we did before. So we'll let this be 3,000. 
This is the frequency in hertz. And if you like, make this negative 3000. At this point here is our sampling frequency, so f of s. There will be a replicant of the original signal, which means we have f s minus 3000 and f s plus 3000. There will be another replicant at 2 times the sampling frequency. This is 2fs. This is 2fs minus 3000 and 2fs plus 3000. And just like our square wave, this pattern continues on to infinity, which isn't too surprising because that stair-steppy signal does in some respect look like a square wave. We can see this spectrum using tools such as GNU Radio. The flow graph, which I'll show you in a moment, starts with a sinusoidal function generator that is connected to an analog to digital converter where the sampling frequency can be adjusted at will. The output of this ADC is connected to a spectrum analyzer which allows us to see the individual tones. Here's the GNU radio flow graph. This is our variable frequency function generator. And these blocks here work together to provide an ADC function with a variable sample rate. To get started, we'll set the sample rate to 11 kilohertz and we'll set our tone generator to 1 kilohertz. If we look at the resulting spectrum, we find the original tone, right? This is our baseband intelligence at 1 kilohertz, which is this one right here. So that's right where we want it to be, 1K. These two are centered about the sampling frequency. You could think of this as the upper side band, and this is the lower side band. Again, not the right terms, but you could think of them as such. So again, that sampling frequency is at 11, so that's right about here. And the tone is at 1 kilohertz, so this one would be at sample plus 1000, which is 12K. And this one would be sample minus 1000, which is about 10. There's another tone way up here. So now you need to think about what that is. That's this frequency times 2, which puts you at about 22, minus 1,000. So this is 2fs minus f sub m. Let's go back and set this sampling frequency lower. So we're reducing it to 5.5K. This tone stays put. Again, this is the original. This is our baseband 1 kilohertz signal. We now have F of S, approximately where the cursor is here. So this is F of S plus F sub M. And this is the sampling frequency minus F sub M. This would be two times the sampling frequency. So this peak is 2fs plus the modulating frequency. And this one is 2 by the sampling frequency minus the modulating frequency. This would be three times the sampling frequency. And right about here would be four times the sampling frequency. We'll do this one more time. We'll lower the sampling frequency to 2.7. This tone remains unchanged. Again, that's our baseband tone that's set to 1K. Where the cursor is now is FS. So this tone is FS plus F sub M, FS minus. 
then you can just walk down the row. So this is two times the sampling frequency where the cursor is now, three times, four times, five times, six times, seven times. Which means this tone right here would be seven times the sampling frequency plus 1,000. I'll leave it to you to work the math, but I believe you'll find that this 20.29 number is correct, given that the sampling frequency is 2.7563 kilohertz and the modulating signal is 1,000. So far, everything is behaving very nicely because we are living within the Nyquist-Shannon criterion. Our sampling rate is two times the modulating signal. See, so even here, as low as this is, the sampling rate of 2.7K is more than double what our modulating frequency is. To show what can go wrong, let's shift our sampling rate back to 11 kilohertz, and then we'll play with this tone. Let's see what happens when we move that tone to 3000. We see that original tone is now at 3000. This is our sample rate approximately where the cursor is. So this is F of S minus F sub M and F of S plus F sub M. So far everything's good. Let's move it to 5,000. Remember that the sample frequency is approximately where the cursor is now, which means that this tone is sampling frequency plus modulating frequency, and this tone is sample frequency minus modulating frequency. With that said, we're going to break Nyquist. Instead of 5,000, let's go to 8,000. Do you see the problem? Tell you what, let's move this frequency around and see if we can come to some better understanding. As we increase the frequency, we're still okay. We're still okay. We're still okay. But these two tones are getting very close to each other. Notice that our modulating frequency is approaching half of the sampling frequency. We continue on a little bit more. And at this point, those two tones have become one because we have just violated the Nyquist criterion. Our modulating frequency is now exactly half of the sampling frequency. If we continue to increase the modulating signal, we're in trouble. This tone right here, which is F of S minus F of M, is now what you will hear in your recording. And I'll tell you right now, it's an ugly sounding tone. You do not want aliases in your music. Let's go back to the drawing board and see if we can find a way to sketch this graphically. When everything is good, we have a spectrum that looks like this. Here's our zero. The second triangle is centered at the sampling frequency the third triangle is centered at two times the sample frequency. And of course, that continues on forever. In the simulation, we placed a tone here. We called it F sub M. It was replicated in these two positions as F sub S minus F sub M and F sub S plus F sub M. And we called this good. Things became bad if we didn't pay attention to Nyquist and let our triangles overlap. And this is zero. 
sample frequency and two sample frequency. Suppose we had a tone here. We'll call that F sub M. That's our baseband tone. It will be replicated here and here. So this one would be F sub S minus F sub M, and this would be F of S plus F sub M. This is what we call a bad signal. It's this tone right here that is the alias that has occurred where it should not occur because the sample rate is not high enough or because the anti-aliasing filter is set in the wrong spot. As we finish our discussion, let me show you what aliasing sounds like. What you're looking at is the spectrum of the sampled data. The sampling frequency is set to 22 kilohertz. By Nyquist, we have to keep the modulating signal band limited to half of that, which we've done. You can see the frequency goes from 0 to 10k. If you're tracking, you know what this piece is. That's f of s minus f sub m. Now let's break it. So we're going to set the sampling frequency very low. And you'll notice immediately that this becomes just a giant mess. And you'll also notice that the noise floor has increased. So let's go back. And so you could see the anti-aliasing filter was doing its job and there were no tones. And that this was in the low spots, right? This average tone was bouncing around somewhere between negative 80 and negative 100 dB. But when we lower the sampling frequency to 5 kilohertz, you'll notice that noise floor jumps up. So there's a lot of noise in this. And, well, let's see what it sounds like. Here's the original. cringeworthy alias. As we head back to the drawing board, I want to leave you with one thought. One note that you must remember, and that is this. You cannot repair a signal that's been corrupted by aliasing. To understand why, just look back at the spectrum. If this was your original beautiful sound file, centered at zero with nice high frequency sounds in this area here, if the sampling is done incorrectly, right? if the sampling is too low, or if the anti-aliasing filters are set wrong, there will be a collision in these spots right here. And that high frequency content will be corrupted. Once it's become corrupted, there's no way to differentiate between the original beautiful high frequency tones and the corruption that's been caused by the aliasing.